Okay, guys. Um, we've jumped over here to the to the gaboons, the the biggest rhinoceros. <laughs> now, the way I keep my gaboons, now my room temperature, my my overall room temperature at night, it drops down about 77, 78 degrees. In the day, it might get a little warmer in here, but not much. You know, we run an air conditioner in the summer to keep it at that level for the buff drops and stuff, and things get certain little. I, I adjust heat as required by species, and I do that with light bulbs and heat tape and different things. But now gaboons, they require a different kind of care than a puff adder. And the ambient humidity in this room is at about 60-65%. But literally now gaboons, they need that humidity. They do good with humidity, but not wet. I mean, I do spray my gaboons to jack up the humidity in their enclosures. But I only do it maybe once or twice a week, and I don't soak the snake down. I actually spray the walls of the cage. And you'll notice I keep my gaboons on mulch. I keep them on hardwood mulch. I keep them on cypress. And the puffs I keep on newspaper. And there's a reason for that. Because the puffs stay dry. And if I could, I'd keep everything on newspaper. But the puff adders, we like to keep them dry and hot. And gaboons need to be warm with some humidity so I use the mulch just so I can spray the mulch maybe once or twice a week to bring the humidity up to the right level but I don't do it to where it's wet if they're too wet for too long and they have a temperature drop they'll end up with a respiratory and the whole thing of it is is gaboons can take it cooler I mean gaboons are comfortable I mean I give my gaboons a little hot spot and they hardly ever use it I mean, once in a blue moon, I might catch them under that hot spot, but they hardly ever use a hot spot. Their ambient temperature in here is at about 80 degrees to 82 degrees, and that's where they stay. Unless I'm breeding gaboons. If I'm cycling them to breed, they'll get a drop at night, which they all get a drop at night regardless, but they'll go cooler at night and then back warm during the day. You can't take gaboons and leave them solid cold in the 60s for months on end. They're going to end up with respiratory. So I do my gaboons for breeding certain time of the year, and this is the trick to it. Gaboons breed during the summer, okay? Our summer here in the States, literally our, uh, August. You got to be able to cool them in August, be able to take their temperatures down at night in August, down into the 60s and then back up to the 80s during the day. Kind of like breeding boas almost, but different time of the year. You know, nighttime a little cooler, daytime back to normal. You do that for several weeks and then back to a regular schedule. But I jack up the humidity when I'm doing that. During that little cycle, they get sprayed a little more often. It simulates a rainy season. Higher humidity, a little bit cooler at night. And that usually spurs breeding. And I've been pretty successful breeding the boons. I've bred them probably 14, 15 times, and I've produced a bunch of gaboons, East African and West African. But their temperatures right now, this time of year, is stable. It's normal. They're getting their nighttime drop, 77, 78 degrees. During the day, they're getting up to about 80 to 82, and that's where gaboons stay. That's where they're thriving at, they're doing good at. I get nice full sheds. I don't have respiratory problems. I don't have anything going wrong with them. And I've raised them from little babies. These were actually some of my captain born ones from a couple years ago. But that's the difference between keeping gaboons and puffs. Puffs need that heat and dry. Gaboons can take it a little cooler with a higher humidity. But like I said, not wet. Wet is bad. Wet is just bad. Wet is what causes a lot of problems. So humidity up, temperature down. And they do a little bit better. But I'm going to go ahead on and feed these guys. They're due for a feed. And same thing like with the puff adders. I feed gaboons an appropriate sized meal. Something big enough that they can sink their fangs into without injuring themselves. I've seen gaboons bite into a prey item that's too small. Right through the prey item. Right through their bottom jaw. I've seen it. You, you, everybody thinks like, oh, that's bull crap. That really never happens. It happens because I've seen it happen. They literally can drill themselves. I mean, their fangs are so damn long. I mean, gaboons got the longest fangs out of anything. They got huge fangs. So they have accidents and they hurt themselves. But we're going to go ahead on and, and feed these guys for you. 
and we're going to do it with the Venom Cam and see if we can get that perfect strike scene. Okay, we're going to slide in here and feed this, this big male gaboon and get this thing set just right and see if we can get a really good straight on fangs in your face strike. Oh, 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 oh man. That was a good one. <laughs> oh, I love it. That was a good one. He drilled that thing. Look at him. Now, see what I was talking about, about prey size? See how that rat is literally, it's a little bit wider than his head. So that's a perfect prey size for him, okay? And when it comes to thickness, see, there's no way he's going to drive his fangs through that rat and injure himself. He's got a little bit of mouth right there. I'm going to pull it out. There you go, buddy. So, but that was awesome. That was a good strike. And, you know, you, when you do this for years, I don't care how many times you've done it, when they jump at you, it's your natural instinct to jump back. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I do it so calmly, my wife looks at me and just goes, you never even flinch. Well, it's because I've seen it a million times and I've done it a million times, but... Oh, I know I didn't flinch. I'm saying, but it, it, it's a natural instinct to jump back. You know what I mean? It, you know, most people would jump back. I mean, but I've I've been doing this so long. I don't I don't get out of the way anymore. I just kind of, you know, I know I'm safe. I know I'm at a safe distance. I know he's going for the rat. My hands are well out of the way. So, all right, we're gonna move over and feed the next one. Okay, and for our last one, we're gonna feed this big male. And he just happens to be right up here on the edge. And let's see how he does. He needs a little tap. And sometimes feeding gaboons, when you go straight on, I swear to God, they're like a damn frog. It's like they don't they don't see it when it's straight in front of them. You gotta kinda go on the side a little bit. Where they get it out of their peripheral. <laughs> oh, ho, 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 man. Good job, Bubba. And like I said, sometimes feeding them, if you go straight at them, they don't hit it. They need to see it from their side view. It's almost like they, they see it on one side of their head and they like to do that sideways strike. And that's another thing that makes gaboons really dangerous is their, their ability to strike backwards and upside down <laughs> and sideways. All right, and he's hanging on to it like a bulldog. We're going to go ahead and lift him back into his cage there and let him eat his rat. Good job, Bubba. Let's get you back in there. Come on, big boy. There you go. Get in there, fool. <laughs> All right. And these are some of my up and comers. These are gonna be these are gonna be nice gaboons. I mean they're already putting on some size. I hand cherry picked these out of one of my clutches a couple of years ago.
Okay, now we're going to jump over and I'm going to feed some of my holdbacks from last year. Now, now these little gaboons are just now like, well, they're a little bit over a year old. And they're, they're quite sizable already. And uh, I actually pulled them down and I'm going to feed them on top of this. I pulled their tub out of the rack so we can get the camera on them and get a good venom cam shot. And you guys can see them with our with our new gear. I mean, because they're actually they're gorgeous. Now I produced this litter last year, and I produced 52 of them. And I handpicked these two that I thought that were going to be the best. I actually held back six, and then I raised them up. And then I thought, okay, that one can go, that one can go. And I gave them to buddies that keep kaboons. And I got the two that I wanted, and they're just spectacular. The male is a very light phase gaboon, and the female is a very dark phase one. So they're extraordinary now when I have baby gaboons born and I'm starting out babies okay now I'll keep babies a little bit warmer than adults I'll keep them you know 82 to 83 degrees and I'll start babies out in substrate when they're little gaboons benefit from substrate because they'll bury up in it and nestle in and they feel safe like that so I'll start baby gaboons out in substrate like a uh, like an aspen or, or maybe even some uh, some different cypress mall, something fluffy though, so they can nestle in and bury up. And it helps them with their feeding response because when they feel hidden and you drop in a live rat pink and it's swirling around and it just, that bam, they light it up. But, and also, I start them in the racks. I start them little baby drawers, next drawer up, next drawer up, but once they get to the size that this one is already, I put them on newspaper. Just until I get them into the next exhibit. And there's a reason for that. Because keeping substrate in racks doesn't work. Mold grows on it. When they defecate, it falls to the bottom of the rack and it hardens like cement. If you miss it for a couple days, mold grows on it because there's not that much circulation getting through them racks and I I burn big air holes in all my stuff that's the heel is making all that noise they're all over the place right now are they no they're getting ready to breed too but so I try not to use substrate in my racking systems I mean I know a lot of ball python guys do it and thing but but for the venomous stuff I don't like to do it I only do it with little baby gaboons and puffs so they can hide but once they get a bit bigger newspaper until they get large enough where I can put them in a big cage but and it holds humidity but the humidity is stagnant it just gets stagnant air stagnant because they require humidity newspaper is easier guys a little mist dries up within 24 hours and you can do it again in a couple days but now I'll start feeding baby gaboons rat pinks and they grow quick I mean literally within several weeks they're on rat puffs they grow fast and I feed the heck out of them I'll feed them every five six days but baby gaboons got this thing where they'll dehydrate okay so what I do is as I'm feeding them and I'm watering them every five six days they're getting fed but I scoop their little butts up and I put them in a little pail of water just you know maybe half an inch of water as soon as they slam their head in it, they start drinking. Because they'll lay in one spot, they won't go to a damn water bowl. I don't know why, they just won't. I've never seen a baby boom drink out of a water bowl. My big ones will go right to a water bowl. It's almost like they're too stupid to find a water bowl. But I pick them up and I put them in a little container and I let them drink. So then I do that every week. I mean, just to keep them well hydrated. And then they defecate normally. You know, and if you get a snake, babies have a tendency... To eat, 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 and they don't defecate. And they get bounced up. So swimming them helps. We call it swimming them. Put them in a tub with a little bit of lukewarm water, and they'll swim and move around just that activity and a little bit of a warmer temperature causes them to defecate. So I start babies out doing that. And it's a pain in the butt when you got 50 of them, and you got to go through and do it. Swim them, water them, feed them. It's a lot of freaking work. That's why I don't, I didn't even breed them this year. I'm like, I'm not breeding the boons this year because I, I don't know what I'm going to do with 50 of them again. So,
But I got my whole batch of my show here. They're gorgeous. Oh my God, they're gorgeous. What do you guys see them? And so we're going to go ahead and feed these guys, and we're going to do it with the Venom Cam. Okay, we're going to go ahead and feed this little youngster. Now, this is one, the little, my little whole-back female. Now, she's really chocolatey, and she's a dark-colored female. And she is absolutely gorgeous. But we're going to try to get... She's the one that does these crazy wild strikes. <laughs> and I usually feed her over her head like this. She, she does some outrageous strikes. And she may not pop because... Oh, no. She's going to. There goes the pupil. She's getting ready to go. Here comes the tongue. Oh, 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 oh my God, that was freaking awesome! Oh, that was awesome. And we've got the other camera set up getting this from a side angle because I don't know if the GoPro is going to pick up them crazy strike angles that she does. Oh, man. And that one was, oh, she drilled it. That was really cool. <laughs> and see, she now she's got a big enough prey item where she can't hurt herself. And that's, that's one of these triple X jumbo mice that I got. <laughs> but, oh, that was awesome. And she's going to hold that thing up there. That was worth waiting for. And my wife goes, that was worth waiting for. I set up this whole damn scene here with the lights and just so you can enjoy her beautiful colors and we can get the strike scene. But uh, it took me an hour to set up the lights and the cameras and get the right angles. And I'm hoping that it came out for you all because the only better thing was to be here standing next to me and see it. <laughs> oh, that was cool. That was so cool. Good job, little girl. You surprised us on that one. That was awesome. But you guys can get a good look at her. This is this is a little girl that I held back. She is just amazing. She's got a lot of dark chocolates in her and these crazy looking blues and I mean she's just a gorgeous gaboon. And she just gets better and better with every shed. Now, you'll notice a lot of gaboons, when they strike and hold, that they hold this thing up off the ground. Okay? Now, I truly believe that. Now, you notice puff adders don't do this, but gaboons do. Gaboons will strike something and they'll hold it up off the ground, similar to the way a Bushmaster does. And it's, I think it's so prey can't escape. And, it, and they don't get no traction or no surface to push off on while they're getting ejected with the venom and they're getting impaled with them monster fangs and they hold them up in the air so it's kind of easier for them you know a, a prey item is not not kicking and scratching and they're holding them up so they don't get no traction on the ground and try to put up a struggle so but that was an awesome strike and I'm actually gonna back up and we're gonna let her swallow this thing. Oh, that was that was cool. And I've got one more we're gonna do. We're gonna do the male, and he looks totally different. He's a very light phase gaboon. He is gorgeous too. But this is gonna be their last feed in this tub. As you can see, they've outgrown these tubs. They're getting ready to get moved over into the next size tub, which are much bigger. Okay, and this is my male holdback. And he is gorgeous. Oh, this is this has got to be one of my favorite gaboons. I love this little gaboon. And he is getting so big. Okay, let's see if we can get a feed into him. I don't know how he's going to act with these lights on him. He needs to get a whiff of that rodent. He 
can see, he acts totally different than that other one. He's very defensive, and now he's stopped. That's an indicator that, okay, I don't want to spook nothing off. I might have a meal coming at me. And he's going to do one of them wild, crazy strikes, too. <laughs> oh, that was cool. Oh, that was so cool. He came straight up and grabbed that one. And he... is look at him shaking he is clamping down he's clamping down like a vice on that thing oh that was so cool that was neat but take a look at this guy talk about a just a screamer of a gaboon this thing is gorgeous he is absolutely beautiful. He's very light. He actually doesn't have any black in him anywhere. It's all all tans and very he's he's very pastel looking. Let's go ahead and see if we can get some video of him up close here. And like I said, gaboons grow rapidly. I mean, these are just a little over a year old. I mean, okay, I'm starting to spook him. And he's ill-tempered. He's a mean little bastard. That's why I'm going to give him a wide berth here. Let him swallow his rodent. I don't know if he's digging that GoPro in his face. <laughs> Dude, you better get used to the Venom cam. We're going to be filming your ass for years to come. We're going to go ahead and let him swallow in peace. I'm going to move this thing away from him. Oh, that was cool. We got to get that on camera. He's working them fangs. I want you guys to see that stuff. Get a better angle here. the hatch okay I know you guys are dying to hear this Mamba story <laughs> and and I'm gonna tell you this is one of the reasons why I don't work with I mean I'll still work with Mambas I mean when we open to the public I'm gonna have to have Mambas on exhibit that's just a snake that you got to have on exhibit but until then I have no reason to keep them I need have no reason to keep a Mamba in my snake house right now not until we open to the public. I'll get a pair. But 
Let me hit on this real quick before I tell you this story. Literally, now, I've bred black mambas in the past, and, and I've kept mambas when I was younger, and I've reproduced them. I did the blacks, the Jamesons, I did the East African greens, but let me tell you something. There is no reason to keep a freaking black mamba. I mean, what's your reasoning? Are you going to breed them and reproduce them and sell them? I mean, that's such a freaking dangerous snake. Fast, unpredictable, and the bites are, you know, even with antivenom, most of the time you're going to roll. You're going to die. And the thing is, is keeping one just to have one and say you got a black mamba, that's a fucking ego trip. That's what that is. And to say, I got a black mom, but I work with mamas, that's just, that's just stupid. It's silly and stupid. I mean, I don't keep them because I have no reason to right now. I mean, the only reason you should be keeping black mambas in a, in a private facility is if you're doing venom extraction or if you're doing some kind of a scientific research on it. And I'm not doing either with a mamba, so I don't keep them. I mean, I have any venom for them. I have an African polyvalent, which covers mambas, but I don't keep them for that reason. I have no reason to. And the snakes that I keep and work with, there's a purpose behind it. There really is. There's things that I'm doing with my animals. But mambas are off my radar. That's just, it's, it's silly. It's just not, there's no reason to keep one. There really isn't. Except your ego. <laughs> and this is what happened to me. And I've had two sketchy experiences with black mambas. Two big ones, as a matter of fact. But this cage right here, okay, I used to have two of these. I bought these in a two unit. There was two of them, all right? And I was using them for, I've used them for a bunch of different things through the years. I bought these brand new. I had two of them. But at the time, I was I was breeding chondros. And I, I had I, I bought these for my chondros. And I ended up having a pair. I, I, I paired them up in one, and I had one empty. So I'm at Hamburg. And a boy comes by my table. He says, hey, one of the other vendors sent me over to you and said that you work with mambas and you, you, you work with venoms. I said, yeah. And he's got a box about this big. It's one of them shift boxes with the glass door. He says, I got about a eight-foot black mamba male that I'm trying to sell. And right away, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm not giving you five, six hundred dollars for it. I, you know, I, I've got two black mambas at home and... I really don't need no more. He says, I'll give it to you for 150 bucks. I'm like, oh, okay, you know. And I, I look in the glass thing. He's got it taped over. And then I look, I, I could see just scales, and I could tell it's a black mamba in there. And this damn snake filled this box. It was, like, tight. So I put it in a safe crate, and I, I ended up taking it home. I put it in this cage. Not, not this one, one just like it. I had two of them now. <laughs> this is part of the story. So, I put the whole shift box with the mom in it in the cage back in the corner. I reach in with these tongs, okay? And I reach in there and I grab the glass, the little, the little slide box door that opens on it, right? And I close it up. I leave him in there for five, six days. He never comes out. I never see him. I'm looking in there at a flashlight. He's in there. I can see him. He, he moves and I, he's alive. I never got to see the damn snake. Never got to really see his head, anything. Or actually how big he was. So I'm thinking, okay, it's been a week. I'm going to try to get a feed into him. Maybe he'll come out and grab a, grab a rat. So I grab a, you know, small rat. It's on the end of these exact tongs, caged, the, the mate to this one. I open this thing up like this, and it's back in the corner. I crack it like this, and I stick this in here with a rat on there, and I close it like this, okay? And I'm tapping this thing around. This mamba shoots out of that hole from that trap box up these tongs. I've got the door pressed like this. Pushes it open out around my arm. And I still got this like this with the rat in it, right? Around my arm, up over my head like this, comes straight up like this. And this bastard's a lot bigger than I thought he was. He was every bit of nine foot and this big around. So I'm like this. He's around, around. He shoots straight up like this. He turns and looks at me, 
starts gaping, opening his mouth and shaking his head. I'm standing here like this, frozen in place, just about pissing my pants. I'm like, what do I do? As he's shaking his head, he comes back down around me, over his shoulder, up to the top of his cage, rides this rim, and shoots right back down into that hole in the shift box. His whole body, oh, that quick. I slam that door, close that son of a bitch up like that. I never opened it again. He stayed in there. I was literally pouring water through the top of the screen for him. I took the whole cage, snake, trap box, everything to the next Hamburg show and sold it. <laughs> and sold it to a guy that actually works with Mambas. Sold the whole thing. He goes, what do you want for I go, 200 bucks. The cage was worth more than that. I was like, never again. Never again. I totally underestimated the speed of that snake and how fast he can do that. And that just threw me off of Mambas. And I didn't work with him again for years until I started running the Cape Fear Serpentary. And we had a bunch of them there. And so I was forced to work with Mambas again. But if you guys see me working with him, you'd be like, oh, he's extra careful now. I mean, but literally, Mambas, no. Not for me, no more. <laughs> There's no reason to have them. I will have to have them when we open to the public. And they'll be shift box, inside, trap doors, never hooking, moving them. Uh-uh. Never again. Not worth it. <laughs> okay, guys, just to hit on some some business captive care techniques that I use. Um, I hope to help you if you guys are breeding some business or, 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 or working with puff adders and gaboons and even rhino vipers. Keep rhino vipers pretty much the same as gaboons. But anyways, if you're new to the channel, go to my logo, the V logo, hit it and subscribe. And please share and give us a thumbs up. Thanks for coming by. Thank you to my supporters. And thank you to the Venom Squad. This is Willie from Venom Central checking out. Later.